Hello everyone, and welcome to a very special episode of Red Raptor Writes. This will be my first in a long series of dinosaur documentary reviews where I judge their accuracy, or lack thereof, and rank them solely on this merit. By the end, I'll have a comprehensive tier list that shows the most and least accurate shows out there. Now, I'm sure I can go back and find some obscure TV programs from before I was even alive, but we're kicking off this tier list with the BBC classic, Walking with Dinosaurs, a show whose impact cannot be overstated. Without it, most dino docs we watch today would never have happened. WWD pioneered in the sense that it took the groundbreaking visual effects that convincingly brought dinosaurs to life in Jurassic Park six years earlier, blending lots of CGI and practical effects, and then used them to make a series so believable that its very premise is that you are literally watching a nature documentary that follows the lives of real dinosaurs. This idea will be borrowed several other times in the future because the end result was amazing. It was nominated for 6 Emmys and won 3, plus its debut New Blood in October 1999 garnered nearly 19 million viewers. None of this will matter in the ranking unfortunately, but I feel the need to emphasize how groundbreaking Walking with Dinosaurs was. Its DNA runs through all future shows on this list, so these videos wouldn't be possible without it. With all that backstory out of the way, let's dig this up. Although Walking with Dinosaurs is regarded by many as the best of these docuseries, I'm not blowing anyone's minds when I say it's a mixed bag. There's a lot of good and a lot of bad here, accuracy-wise I mean. No matter how many criticisms I raise against it, Walking with Dinosaurs is still a great show. Thankfully, you won't need to hear those yet, because I'm starting with the positives. First and foremost, the entire point of the series works extremely well. While I think the first two Jurassic Parks did a good job at showing how dinosaurs were just normal animals, with the mainstream largely seeing them as big, scary killing machines, it was a great step to create a nature documentary, but with Mesozoic animals in place of living ones, showing how familiar they can be. That these were normal animals, not monsters. Many of the stories shown center around relatable topics such as maturing, parenting, hunting, mating, defending territory, and surviving in a hostile environment. All these things we see from creatures today. It's this approach to prehistoric life that has been repeated many times over at this point. You know, when the creators actually know what they're doing. Getting more specific with the stories though, WWD presents many factual narratives to its audience. Dinosaurs and pterosaurs out surviving other Triassic reptiles, allowing them to dominate the planet by the time of the Jurassic. Yup, it sounds good to me. Dinosaurs having to lay large nestfuls of eggs because of a high mortality rate. Uh, it's sad, but true. Parental instincts in Tyrannosaurus and many other dinosaurs, also accurate. Many of the environments, too, looked about right for the times and places they represented. It's impressive how the filmmakers found so many grassless locations to shoot in, since it didn't appear until after the Mesozoic. Late Triassic Arizona looks as it should with the world more arid than it is today, especially within the interior of Pangaea. But there were wet and dry seasons, much like in the show. The Morrison Formation was a land of floodplains with forests of cycads, conifers, and ferns that were fed on by the many large herbivores. Europe, instead of being a unified continent, became a series of islands by the end of the Jurassic. Dinosaurs were living in the poles, dealing with freezing temperatures. For the most part, the environments were spot on. My only exception would be Hell Creek, which is often presented as a volcanic ash field in media, but should be more floodplains like the Florida Everglades. Now for the animals themselves. Unfortunately, I'll have to cover the majority of them under the negative category, but there are many bright spots. Some creature designs like the Coelophysis, Ophthalmosaurus, Edmontosaurus, called an Atatitan, and Iguanodon were pretty spot on or close enough to the point that any arguments against them would be pure nitpickery. These, along with a few others, look great and hold up really well. More credit where credit is due, the juvenile T-Rexes look about right. I like how they're not just smaller copies of the adults, but they're leaner, have longer legs, a longer snout, have larger arms. Tyrannosaurs changed their appearance a lot throughout their life, and I'm glad the show captured that. Also, everything behaves like it should. 
Every dinosaur, pterosaur, and whatever else acts accordingly. Walking with dinosaurs typically avoids monster movie moments where a creature behaves in an awesome bro manner just to wow the audience. This is one of the few dino documentaries and dinosaur things in general where they're not constantly roaring at the top of their lungs. Like for Pete's sake, please shut up. Using trees as defense, ducks in and out, trying to get in close enough to attack the Allosaurus. Shut up! Just shut up, you idiot! Like every portrayal of dinosaurs in media, walking with dinosaurs included plenty of speculation, which is of course needed, since we don't know every single detail about extinct fauna. With the presence of speculation always comes controversy, such as the decision to have the Plotticus occasionally rear up on its hind legs. That example eventually worked out for them with future studies which showed their center of mass to be close to the hind legs, allowing them to stand up. But the creators weren't always so lucky. Overall, the series didn't push too many wild theories and proved to be very conservative to the point where it would make even Rand Paul proud. No double brain stegosaurus, no toxic rex bite, and no sound blasting parasaurol office. Yeah, we're gonna see some crazy stuff throughout these videos. And although there are plenty of inaccuracies, I can at least tell what every prominent subject is supposed to be, unlike some shows where I'm left scratching my head wondering who the heck gave the stamp of approval on some of their models. Okay, I'm beginning to feel ranty. On to the negatives. For pretty much every compliment I can give walking with dinosaurs comes a slew of exceptions. For everything that was accurate comes something else that was inaccurate or didn't hold up. Those are the two categories of negatives you'll see in these tier videos. There is information that was accurate at the time, but has since fallen out of favor. These flaws I'll be much more generous towards, because of course the creators and their consultants couldn't predict the future, they didn't know what finds or studies would occur in 20 years. Then we get the inaccuracies that were due to negligence, facts presented that were, are, and always will be WRONG! But starting with the former, many dinosaurs just shout 90s. At the time the BBC was making its series, it was believed that Plateosaurus and Postosuchus, each with big appearances in New Blood, typically walked quadrupedally, but could go biped if they wanted to. Unfortunately for the BBC, both have since been determined to be obligate bipeds, meaning that a quadrupedal stance would have been impossible. Also at this time, it was believed that the Plotticus and its close relatives kept their necks horizontal to the rest of the body, not being able to raise their head above their shoulders. This idea also has since fallen out of favor, leading to more curved necks, and curves are always better. Other outdated Morrison dinosaurs include Stegosaurus and Ornitholestes. The classic 90s and early 2000s Stego design has them with super dummy thick hips. However, in 2003 came Sophie, the most complete and well-preserved specimen to date. Now with a better picture of the animal, it's clear that the genus didn't possess big butts, but was more in line with other stegosaurs. Ornithalestes was prominently featured in the documentary, displaying a prominent crest on its nose. This came from a misconception at the time that the incomplete section of the skull represented where some sort of nose horn was beginning, when in fact this shape just occurred from the remains being crushed. More outdatedness comes in Spirits of the Ice Forest, which heavily features a theropod only named the Polar Allosaur, since that species had yet to be named at the time of release. Welp, there is a name for it now. Australavenator. Australavenator. Australavenator, meaning Southern Hunter. It turns out Australavenator isn't an allosaur at all, it's a Megaraptorin a recent grouping that has been classified within Allosauroidea in the past, but more recent analyses have placed these guys within Solorosauria outside of Tyrannosauroidea. Basically, not allosaurs of any kind. Two ornithopods from the show have also dealt with naming issues. In Giant of the Skies, our pterosaur protagonist flies over the east coast to find an American species of Iguanodon. They have since been reclassified as their own genus, the Cotodon. The Aladar wannabes are joined by a North American Polacanthus, which experienced a similar fate, be confirmed as its own genus, Hoplitosaurus. 
The other ornithopod is a Nana Titan, which was featured as T-Rex prey in Death of a Dynasty. We can get into a long, confusing history lesson, but basically since 2011, Anata Titan has been reclassified as a species of Edmontosaurus, e Anectins, meaning the name given in the show is no longer valid. With all that being said, I think we're good on the outdated stuff. Again, I hold no animosity for these. Science is always progressing, so it's only natural for dinosaur documentaries to eventually date themselves. This is a good thing, it just means we're learning more and more. So now it's time for the bad mistakes, the flaws that have no excuse. This is really what I'm looking at. Many, many creatures throughout Walking with Dinosaurs find themselves in the wrong time or place. Plateosaurus, which has only been found in Western Europe, decided to drop on by to Arizona for a heat stroke. Cruel Sea supposedly takes place 149 million years ago, but has main subjects over 160 million years old like Eustreptospondylus, Leoplorodon, and Ophthalmosaurus. Then there's Giant of the Skies. Gosh, I don't know what they were thinking. Let's take Utah Raptor. Awesome dinosaur. Where do you think Utah Raptor is from? Utah. Apparently that was just too complicated for the writers because they took the Utah Raptor and gave it a vacation in Europe. At least Brad isn't on this one. Gosh, I hate Brad. Anyway, next Spirits of the Ice Forest transports a bunch of Australian animals and has them all in Antarctica. Walking with dinosaurs wasn't wrong that in the early Cretaceous, the modern day southern continents were conjoined into the continent Gondwana, but all the dinosaurs in the episode were only found in Australia. In the final episode, Dromaeosaurus quantum leaped to the end of the Cretaceous instead of dying out earlier. Moving on from all the quantum leaping, while some of the dinosaur designs can be attributed to the time the series was made, there are still plenty of blatant inaccuracies that could have been easily avoided. Generally speaking, walking with dinosaurs flirted with pronated wrists. Some theropods did have them, some didn't, and I have no idea why. Like, if they knew Coelophysis and Allosaurus had inward-facing palms, how come they didn't do the same for T-Vex and the raptors? Speaking of raptors, I haven't even mentioned feathers yet! Come on, Tim Haynes. I know the show came out in 1999, but Feathers in Dinosaurs was already known. Ornithalestes had a few quills here and there, but not much. The narrator flat out stated that pterosaurs had fur, but none of this is shown. Don't. Don't give me hope. The show knows what it must do, but doesn't have the strength to do it. A lot of shrink wrapping was present too. Please, someone, give these dudes a sandwich! The poor guys are starving! Viewers at home, try to keep these criticisms in mind, because I will certainly be coming back to them for future documentaries. Moving on from the common 90s, early 2000s problems, Walking with Dinosaurs, I think, really struggled with theropods. I don't know why, but a bunch of them have weird head shapes. The T-Vex looks like a weird humanoid monster. You strep the spondylus, should have a longer, thinner megalosaur snout, but instead got a generic blunt head. And the Allosaurus is all kinds of funky. There's too much to complain about there, so I'll save it for the upcoming Big Al review. Outside of the theropods, Leylinosaura lacked its comedically long tail. Ankylosaurus had the right idea with the osteoderms, but had a bulbous spherical shape as if it took the Super Size Me challenge. A Neurognathus looked like a generic pterosaur instead of its bizarre self. And Quetzalcoatlus looked more like a bad Ornithochiris reskin. I can't tell whether time, money, or apathy caused these mistakes, but whatever the reason, we know they could have done better here. Now finally, the last major flaw with WWD is their scaling. A good number of extinct fauna were shown to be much larger than their real life counterparts. Ornithochiris was given an absurd wingspan of 12 meters, despite being only half that size. Ornithalesses got a big increase too. And I've saved the best flaw for last. The infamous 25 meter long Leoplorodon. How dare you! Ah! Oh my god! 
guys, I do not have enough memes in my inventory. Not enough to give this Brachio turd the mocking it deserves. <sighs> I guess I'll have to explain this. So, really the genus of marine reptile only grew between 5 and 7 meters in length, about great white shark size. Very fragmentary remains have been found that suggest much larger sizes than this for some pliosaur out there, with estimates of 20 meters given. Take whopping spoonfuls of salt because again, very fragmentary. Somehow the makers of Walking with Dinosaurs decided, well who's to say these small scraps of remains represent the largest specimen, let's add another 5 meters. And that's how we got the meme that is 4 to 5 times larger than the real animal. Alright guys, it's time to hand out my first rating to begin the Dino Documentary tier list, and it's not an easy call. The 1999 classic Walking with Dinosaurs has plenty of good, plenty of bad, and plenty of outdated. Creator Tim Haynes got a lot right and a lot wrong but nailed dinosaurs as a whole and ushered in a wave of dinosaur shows that used the nature documentary format to emphasize how these were real animals. For that, I give him and the BBC credit. Overall, I'm giving Walking With Dinosaurs a C+. If we were to talk about it as a show, as entertainment, then it would rank much higher. However, my grade is based solely on accuracy, so don't take this as a slight against the show. I love it too, I've watched it as a youngling and many times since, but thankfully science has moved forward. Oh, and you might notice Jurassic Fight Club is already in F tier. I did a rant video and a rewrite video on that already, so I have nothing more to say in a review like this. If you want to see it, go check it out. But anyways, what do you guys think? Any more compliments to give? Any more criticisms to be had? Where would you rate it on the scale? Let me know in the comments down below. And remember, if you enjoyed this video, to please leave a like, subscribe, and check out my social media. See you next time.